post-war America, or at least the aesthetic of it, has become one of the great mythologies of the modern age. While the Second World War shattered economies across the world, it sent the United States into the stratosphere. The first financial and military superpower had entered the global consciousness, riding high on VE and VJ Day triumphs, a place of prosperity and optimism, pretty wives and handsome husbands in brand new suburban paradises with shiny new cars and white picket fences, raising two kids who would become the scientists, politicians and business moguls of tomorrow. While fellow victors France struggled to rebuild and Britain labored on under rationing for another decade, everything was going just fine in the States. And rock and roll was just around the corner. Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe, both on the horizon. Life was good. Like all great mythologies, there's a grain of truth here. This was a reality for some, certainly not for all. Race, sexuality, class. All of these factors played a role in what kind of hand you'd be dealt in post-war America. Segregation in the armed forces would continue until 1948 and would remain in some schools even after it was banned in 1954. Moves to decriminalize homosexuality wouldn't begin until the early 60s. The working classes, excluded from the new dream of shirt and tied professionals, felt the squeeze, with rising prices forcing many into poverty or industrial action. World War II had put more women into the workforce than ever before, but many of those who wanted a little more than taking care of the kids and getting dinner ready on time would find their dreams dashed. And then there were those unlucky enough to live in corrupt towns. One of the things that had kept American soldiers going during the horror of war was the notion of justice. America was not a genocidal fascist state like Nazi Germany. It was not enthralled to a god emperor like Imperial Japan. It was a beacon of democracy and fairness. At least, it was supposed to be. The troops that came home to Athens, Tennessee in the months following the surrender of Japan might have felt somewhat disappointed, like the democracy and freedom they'd supposedly been fighting for was little more than a shell. This was why on August 1st, 1946, the United States saw one of only a very few successful insurrections to date, a violent explosion of frustration and anger that would influence the way the country was run to this day. Thanks for joining us as we explore the Battle of Athens, an event that is often left out of the chocolate box image of post-war American prosperity. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is one of America's best loved presidents and with good reason. Steering the country out of economic disaster with his new deals in the 1930s and leading the nation to the brink of victory in the Second World War while suffering from debilitating illness, FDR's story is a remarkable one. In 1936, Roosevelt won re-election in a landslide, powered back into office after winning all but 8 of 531 electoral college votes. But while FDR was certainly popular, he owed some of his success to his fellow Democrats in positions of power around the country. Fellow Democrats that included E.H. Crump. Boss Crump, as he was known, was at various points the mayor of Memphis, the city's treasurer, the commissioner of fire and police, and the holder of other public offices. For most of his career, however, he was a kingmaker and puppet master, installing people he liked in the mayor's office and pulling the political strings around Memphis. Many in Memphis were well aware that Crump was working behind the scenes, but they didn't mind too much. He was doing good work for a city and state ravaged by the Great Depression, by natural disaster, and by racial inequality. Crump and his men secured a $9 million investment from federal coffers after the Mississippi burst its banks in 1937 and won significant support from the local African American community, paving roads and building parks in their neighborhoods. Boss Crump was out to line his own pockets and garner popular support, and the people of Memphis were largely happy to let him do so. He danced to the beat of his own drum, but as long as he carried the traditionally Republican state of Tennessee for the Democrats every time, the White House didn't seem to mind either. Crump's controversial tactics might have played well in Memphis, but they left the door open for similar bending of the rules elsewhere in Tennessee. Hundreds of miles away, in McMinn County, another set of unorthodox politicians were exerting their own brand of control. 
Paul Cantrell was elected to the office of sheriff in McMinn County in 1936. Installed as a candidate by E.H. Crump, the local boy Cantrell was able to secure the sheriff's office for the Democrats thanks in part to the popularity of FDR as well as the influence of Crump in Tennessee. Cantrell would be back in the sheriff's office once again after an election in 1938 and for a third time in 1940 before joining the state senate in 1942. Pat Mansfield served as Cantrell's trusted deputy and lieutenant. Born in Georgia, Mansfield became a key component of Cantrell's political plan for McMinn County, and when the sheriff moved to the Tennessee Senate, it would be Mansfield who stepped in to take the reins. Sheriffs are often salaried in the United States, working for a defined wage and a regular paycheck. Cantrell and Mansfield were earning around $60,000 a year, a huge amount of money in the 30s and 40s, but still sought to supplement their income in other ways. They were permitted to draw a further $2,000 a year for superintending the local workhouse, which they did. The task of superintending proved very easy, as McMinn didn't have a workhouse. On top of salaries and bonuses, they worked on a fee basis, collecting money every time they booked, detained, and released a prisoner. This, some believe, led to egregious abuses of power. Cantrell and Mansfield reportedly began looking for easy marks. Busloads of tourists passing through McMinn would be pulled over and ticketed for drunkenness, raking up a healthy source of revenue for the sheriffs and their deputies. It's alleged that these operations pulled in $300,000 between 1936 and 1946. Crump was keen to keep his men in their positions of power. In 1941, he sponsored a change in state legislation, slashing the number of voting precincts by almost half and essentially guaranteeing his ongoing influence in the state through a policy of gerrymandering and political positioning. Cantrell and Mansfield also did their bit to consolidate power. Allegations of voter intimidation and electoral fraud began to circulate. Those that attempted to witness ballot counting and election officiating within the town's democratic offices were reportedly beaten, pistol whipped, and even shot at. The Federal Department of Justice looked into this in 1940, 1942, and 1944, but decided not to take action. According to some in McMinn County, the names of deceased men and women were counted among the voters, while Cantrell and Mansfield recruited ex-convicts and criminals to serve as deputies, while many of the county's young men were away fighting the war. After years in power, it was said that the Cantrell-Mansfield machine controlled everything, from the sheriff's office to newspapers and even schools. War veteran Bill White would later say, you couldn't even get hired as a school teacher without their okay, or any other job. It was September 1944 when Earl Ford, on active service with the Navy's construction battalion, returned home to Athens on leave. Out drinking in the town, Ford and a friend encountered George Sperling and Clyde Davis, two convicted criminals employed as sheriff's deputies. It's alleged that Sperling pursued the two men out of the bar and set upon Ford with a weapon, smashing him over the head. Ford, with his hands raised, was told not to move, and he complied. What happened next is disputed. Mansfield's men claimed Ford had produced the knife, other witnesses said there was no knife and that Ford was not resisting. What's not disputed is that Earl Ford was shot, doubling over the bar's parking area and lying on the ground for 20 minutes before anyone came to his aid. He did not survive. The situation back home in McMinn County was already well understood by the servicemen in combat overseas. It didn't take long for the news of the shooting to reach the men out there on the front lines of Europe and the Pacific. Ralph Duggan, an Athens boy serving in the Pacific, would say that he thought a lot more about McMinn County than he did about his Japanese adversaries, and about the German forces still holding out in Europe. If democracy was good enough to put on them, he said, it was good enough for McMinn County too. There was a sense among the local population that things would start to change when the boys came home. The war in Europe came to an end in May 1945, while the Pacific campaigns continued almost to the end of summer, with the US armed forces implementing a point system that decided who could return to their families and who would need to stay behind as part of an occupying mission. By 1946, however, huge numbers of American servicemen were back in the United States, returning to towns across the country, including Athens, Tennessee. 
the Cantrell-Mansfield political machine was unperturbed. Rather than registering the returning GIs as a threat, they saw them as an opportunity. These were men with fresh paychecks left over from the mustering out ceremony. Groups of deputies began rounding up veterans, hitting them with trumped up charges, or simply hitting them, in an effort to prize those army dollars out of their hands. In May 1946, the returning veterans decided enough was enough. They would not be shaken down by the men of the Cantrell Mansfield machine, and their town and their county would be delivered from the corruption and subjugation it had endured for a decade. Returning veterans numbered 3,000 in McMinn, around 10% of the county's population. While not all got on board with the new movement, plenty did. The GI Nonpartisan League was formed, an organization aligned with neither party, championing the cause of democracy in McMinn. The result was three Republican candidates and two Democrats selected by the nonpartisans to represent the voting demographics of the county. But this wasn't all. If Cantrell and Mansfield were going to fight the election, really fight it with fists and clubs and bullets, then the nonpartisans would need a response. They'd fought battles from Normandy to Berlin and from the Solomons to Okinawa, and now they might need to do the same on home soil. When polls opened on August 1st, the tense mood had given way to something far more sinister. 200 armed deputies stalked the streets of McMinn County. Poll watchers found their duties obstructed. In Etowa, one was arrested. At 3 p.m., an African-American farmer by the name of Tom Gillespie was prevented from casting his vote. When GI poll watchers intervened, the scene turned ugly. A deputy produced a knuckle duster and beat Gillespie. When Gillespie fled, CM Wise, also known as Windy, shot him in the back. Wise would be the only person to face charges after the events of August 1946, serving a single year in prison as a result. Appalled by what was going on, the non-partisans headed to the office of Jim Buttram, a campaign manager. Buttram reached out to Tennessee Governor McCord and US Attorney General Tom Clark pleading for assistance in running a free and fair election. Assistance did not come. At the Waterworks polling station, Wise and another deputy, Carl Neal, took two poll watchers hostage. They would escape, but gunfire was reported at the scene and the people of Athens understood that something significant was about to take place. By now, the GIs were arming themselves at the s &K garage. The deputies, Understanding that they had a fight on their hands, closed down the polling station and secured the ballot box in the nearby jail while sending out more of their men to rearrest the escapees. These deputies were overpowered by the GIs, taken out into the woods, stripped and beaten. They were lucky to get away with their lives. Some among the GIs reportedly advocated shooting them. Other skirmishes broke out at the 12th precinct polling station. After GI poll watchers were once again obstructed, and some brutally beaten, non-partisan leaders opted to break into the National Guard armory to reinforce themselves with weaponry. As polls closed on August 1st, they knew it was a do or die moment. They'd broken the law and the new day would bring reinforcements for the deputies. Inaction would be suicide. They'd have to act. Holding up in the local jail, around 50 deputies, along with Mansfield and George Woods, the Speaker of the State House of Representatives and Secretary of the McMinn County Election Commission began a chaotic count of the votes. A huge number of the GI nonpartisans had now gathered outside the jail, with estimates ranging from a few hundred to two thousand. The GIs demanded that the ballot boxes be handed over, decrying the election conditions as grossly unfair and undemocratic. This request was refused. The GIs now had the jail surrounded and opened fire. Leader of one of the GI detachments, Bill White, claims he fired the first shot from his position in the bank overlooking the jail. Speaking in 2000, White gave his account like this. You damn thief grabbers, bring them ballot boxes out of there. That's just what I said. One of those deputies said, by God, I heard a bolt click and they started scattering around. I had a pistol, a shotgun, and a rifle, and I pulled the pistol out and started firing down there at them. Then, the whole lineup there started firing on the jail. Over the coming hours, gunfights and fistfights rolled back and forth across the streets outside the jail. The GIs knew they would be arrested at first light, and so they kept up the pressure. 
Some deputies escaped out of a back door, including George Woods. Woods reportedly contacted Birch Briggs in neighboring Polk County in a desperate request for reinforcements. Briggs allegedly replied, do you think I'm crazy? By the early hours of August 2nd, the GIs had given up on forcing a surrender from outside. They set about dynamiting the jail, hurling sticks of explosives at the building as boom, blast and debris split the hot summer night air. Rioting had now broken out across the city, targeting police cars and the properties of suspected deputies. Finally, the GIs blew upon the door of the jail, surging into the shattered building. The remaining deputies surrendered around 3.30 a.m. The votes were counted and Knox Henry, a GI-backed candidate, was declared the winner. George Woods, still not comfortable with the idea of returning to Athens in person, said he would verify the election certificate to make Henry the official new sheriff. An order to send in the National Guard was rescinded, and the GIs peacefully handed over control to the local police. CM Wise was the only person on either side who faced charges following the events of that bloody evening. The GI nonpartisan movement was instrumental in bringing the boss era of Tennessee politics to an end. The violence of August 1st into 2nd showed that people would not stand for strongman shows of power in government offices. Throughout September, those who had been complicit in the Cantrell Mansfield machine handed in their resignations, but not always peacefully. The heavily armed supporters of the GIs could dish out a bit of intimidation themselves, and this hastened the decision for many of those involved. But things did not go smoothly for the new government in McMinn. Those who had been unified in the fight for justice would find themselves divided along old party lines. Attempts to create a new party outside of the Republican-Democrat hegemony came to nothing. In addition to this, not everyone saw the actions at Athens in the late summer of 1946 as a positive thing. For many, it played into existing fears that returning GIs would be dehumanized, trained killers ready to enact violence on anyone who stood in their way. This was almost certainly not the case in McMinn, where the community had been pushed to breaking point by a decade of corrupt governance, but it did little to assuage the fears of some sections of the general public. The Battle of Athens wasn't a revolution. It didn't change the course of politics and history in the United States. But it did represent a watershed, proof that those in elected office could, should, and would be held accountable for unconstitutional actions. Abraham Lincoln, concluding his famous Gettysburg Address, made the plea that governance of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. In 1946, the GI Nonpartisan Alliance made sure, for this corner of the state of Tennessee at least, this would continue to be the case. But what do you think? Was the Battle of Athens a watershed moment in post-war domestic politics in America? Or is this just a small example of civil disobedience in one county of a sprawling country? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.